Thank you, members. We now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Cindy McLaughlin. Sure. Question number one, Minister. Mr Speaker, work has been progressing across the Department of Justice and the wider justice system to prepare as far as is possible for the end of transition period. The key risks for my department from the EU exit are the loss of EU tools that facilitate cooperation by law enforcement partners and the impact of EU exit on crime, organised crime and public disorder. Planning to mitigate these risks continues to be impacted by uncertainty around the shape of any future security partnership and the nature of the wider relationship between the UK and the EU at the end of the transition period. Minister, for your answer, does the Minister agree that the removal and access to the European arrest warrant would be a backward step for policing and justice here in Northern Ireland? Well, Mr Speaker, there are a number um, of tools for law enforcement within the European suite of uh, tools and sharing and cooperation that we have, of which the European arrest warrant is key. There are other mechanisms in place at this point as a fail-safe mechanism when it comes to issues around extradition, but none of them are as effective or as efficient in terms of their operation as the European arrest warrant has proven to be. Nicole Emma Rogan. I just want to apologise for not being in my place earlier as well at a previous question time. Um, does the Minister agree with me that a no-deal Brexit will leave our criminal justice, justice agencies at a disadvantage in tackling crime, particularly along the border corridor? Mr Speaker, we are working very hard in order to ensure that we are able to maintain safety and security um, and good order in terms of the justice system. However, there will of course um, be issues around some of the protocols um, that we have been able to rely on um, up to date. There is, for example, a particular issue around uh, data adequacy, which ensures that we can in live time share information across borders. Um, that data adequacy agreement is not yet in place, and it is a key issue um, for justice should we exit the transition period without that agreement being um, in place. That is the day-to-day -day impact that this would have in terms of the ability of operational partners to share personal data for the de detection and prosecution um, of pan-EU crime, and particularly um, of cross-border crime. So there is clearly um, a challenge to be reached within the next eight weeks, um, and there is a, a real pressure, I think, on all of those involved in these negotiations um, to get down to the detail, um, to get this over the line, and to get an agreement which will allow us to continue to provide a safe, a secure, um, and a good cooperative relationship across the border. I call Doug Beatty. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Does the Minister not agree uh, that in light of contact between domestic terrorist groups uh, in Northern Ireland and international terrorist groups uh, in the Middle East, uh, that following the end of the transition period, it would be folly for Northern Ireland not to align itself with the rest of the UK on the Counter-Terrorism and Sentencing Bill? Well, the member has strayed somewhat off um, the issue of the EU adequacy and preparation. The counter-terrorism bill, obviously, and, and terrorism in general, is not a devolved matter. It is a matter um, for the Home Office to take forward. However, there are areas where it impacts upon um, the operation of local justice. And as the member will be aware, I took the matter to the executive. I liaised with um, party leaders. And unfortunately, there was no agreement um, from the parties of this House um, how to actually get an LCM through this chamber in terms um, of having that legislative consent motion agreed, whether it be a limited or a full one. So unfortunately, um, on, on this occasion, it will be a matter for Westminster to continue, um, as was the case before. I should have said that uh, oral questions 8, 11 and 14 have been withdrawn, and I call Liz Kimmins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as I have advised the House previously, I remain committed to working with criminal justice and health partners to further improve how cases of child sexual exploitation are handled. A multi-agency task and finish group is considering the Shigeni report in line with the work being progressed by the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland and other partners responsible for the operational response to child sexual exploitation and existing child protection mechanisms and protocols. In taking this forward, my officials are having ongoing discussions with partners in the Department of Health, the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland, the Health and Social Care Board and the PSNI and are developing an action plan which we will share with Sajini once ready. 
On an issue such as this, I'm always open as to how we can improve outcomes for victims by working together, be together better and more strategically. And this is what we will be considering as we finalise our action plan in response to the Sajeni report and seek to implement the recommendations. Ms. Kevin, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. And strategic Recommendation 1 recommends that DOJ, uh, within six months, take forward a cross-departmental strategic response to tackle child, child sexual abuse and exploitation. Four months on, can the Minister assure us that work is underway in conjunction with the PSNI and the PPS to deliver this recommendation in a timely fashion? The majority of the recommendations in the Sajini report um, are operational and will fall to statutory partners to deliver, but the report does recognise the importance of ensuring a coordinated strategic multi-agency approach to this issue. A multi-agency task and finish group is, uh, in, is considering the report in line with the work being progressed by the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland and other partners responsible for the, operation, um, the operational response to child sexual exploitation and existing child protection mechanisms and protocols. The group is also considering the Sajeni recommendations alongside those in the recent Leonard Consultancy Report on Child Sexual Exploitation that was commissioned by the Safeguarding Board, given that there is a crossover in those recommendations. That should ensure a considered and joined up approach to the strategic and operational recommendations in both reports. It will include how my department and our criminal justice partners best support those elements that have a health lead and vice versa. Uh, through this, a more coordinated and effective response should be able to be secured. The call, Paul Given. The inspectorate's report was very critical of the lack of strategic leadership in addressing uh, the outworkings of the Marshall report that was completed in 2014. It calls for a step change, uh, and it then makes the strategic recommendation that the Department of Justice need to lead the multi-department. Uh, response to this. Can the Minister give an assurance to this House that she will take on that responsibility and drive forward the kind of response that we need to see? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Senator Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I note the Minister's work to date on this, but I would ask her, could you define or give a, a timeline of when we can expect to see some results from this work? Well, the department obviously is working um, collaboratively in terms of taking this forward. Um, my department doesn't have a strategic lead for issues in relation to child protection. However, I do recognise that more can be done to enhance our strategic response and ensure that by working closely with partners, we get the best outcome for victims. Um, in terms of a timeline, there are some challenges. So, for example, around the Marshall Inquiry, there were a suite of recommendations across a number of departments and bodies. Progress reports have been published by the Department of Health, while a child protection and senior officials group is also led by that department. And what we hope to be able to do is, over the coming months, um, to be able to provide more updates to the committee and to the Assembly in terms of progress in relation to this uh, serious issue. And I call Justin McNulty. Mr Speaker, across the justice system, the impact of COVID-19 has been felt in how services are delivered from the police, how courts operate, how people are kept safe in custody and for those under supervision in the community. Huge efforts have gone into managing the impacts of COVID-19, with organisations quickly adapting their practices to comply with public health guidance and to put in place contingency arrangements. This has included conducting risk assessments of premises to ensure that the safety of essential workers and those in our care can be maintained, increasing the use of various digital platforms to engage with members of the public and those in contact with the justice system and, where possible, enabling staff to work from home through the provision of IT equipment. Examples of innovative practice include virtual visits and virtual learning in custody, the increased use of live links by courts to enable remote access for defendants, victims and witnesses, and digital recording of statements provided remotely by victims and witnesses. From the end of September, the full range of courts and tribunal services have resumed, albeit at reduced capacity due to the necessary social distancing controls. Each justice organisation has a recovery plan in place, with progress carefully monitored and adjusted in light of the trajectory of the virus in the community and overseen by the Criminal Justice Board. Justin McNulty, supplementary. I would come to thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I would just like further clarification in terms of working from home and uh, social distancing in relation to policing. And can you give me assurance that all efforts will be made to ensure the most heinous crimes against the most vulnerable within our society will continue to be met with the full rigours of policing and the law? 
despite any COVID-19 limitations. Well, it's very clear that for most policing operations, working from home is not an option. Whilst there may be some scope um, for people to be able to operate remotely um, when it comes to paperwork and other things, most policing does require them to be present um, and active on the scene. I can certainly assure that there will be impacts on the PSNI as a result of COVID-19. I can't assure people that there will be none. That would be foolhardy. I think that the PSNI, however, have responded um, excellently when it comes to being able to respond to those challenges, which include the additional burden, which they didn't previously have, um, of having to manage COVID regulations and the enforcement procedures around those. But I think what we are seeing um, from the PSNI in terms of their response, um, it has taken a toll certainly on officers and there are issues about people having to self-isolate. We keep that under review and where we are asked for more resource or more assist assistance, we are open to have that discussion with the PSNI. I call in the Dillon. Minister for answers thus far. Just the minister has alluded to the fact that the, you know, the courts have, have resumed. However, there obviously is a, quite a backlog. Can the minister give us assurances that there are mitigations in place? Should there be any further COVID restrictions to ensure that that backlog is reduced and dealt with, particularly around family court cases and then in relation to those that have very vulnerable victims involved? In well, as the member will be aware, Mr. Speaker, uh, significant work was undertaken within the courts to ensure that we were able to um, hopefully continue to operate the courts in as normal a fashion as possible um, once they restarted. So there was physical distancing measures put in place, reorganisation of courts. Two court systems have been introduced so that deliberations are held in a separate court um, to, to the main trial. Um, and a, quite a number of different and innovative systems have been put in place. Members will also be aware that we are looking at um, additional capacity um, in terms both of circulation space and potentially the opportunity um, to hold some of our family courts um, and tribunals at other locations. And the department is working very closely uh, with others in SIB and indeed um, some arts organisations, obviously, whose premises will not be um, particularly busy over the next period um, in order that we can utilise those to the best possible outcome for justice. In terms of the speed um, of, pro of processing, of course, it is correct to say um, that there will be a backlog at the moment. That backlog um, would, would suggest that we have now real um, time reporting. And from that, we can tell that there are around 51% more cases in the court system than there were on the 1st of March. So that is a significant increase in the number um, of pieces of business that the court has to do. However, last month was the first month where we actually saw the number of cases being progressed um, exceed the number of cases incoming, which suggests that some inroads are now being made into tackling that, back, uh, that backlog. And there will, as the member will also understand, given the complexity of the justice system, be different impacts right across the different stages of the system. They call Roy Beggs. The National Police Chiefs Council recommends engage, explain, encourage and ultimately enforce. Does the Minister for Justice accept that in failing to chair the COVID uh, working group uh, that she has, enforcement working group, that she has failed to demonstrate leadership? I neither accept the premise of the question that I failed to chair it, nor do I accept the inference taken from it. I thank the Minister for her questions so far. Would the Minister give me her assessment of inappropriate referrals from various statutory agencies to women's aid shelters? Inappropriate in that there hasn't been an incident, not least a, a recent one anyway, um, and it seems to be getting referrals because they have spaces. So housing executive police seem to be referring to women's aid um, to, to be able to house people. For raising it with me. It's not an issue that has been raised directly with me by Women's Aid. There certainly has been an increase in the amount of reporting to Women's Aid and to other helplines, largely as a result, I think, of people's awareness being raised about domestic abuse um, over the last eight months, but also, I think, due to the campaigns that we have had on social media and on television, encouraging people to report. I think many people phoned up where there wasn't an immediate issue, but concerned about um, family or friends who may be at risk of domestic abuse, but perhaps cut off from their normal networks of support, but I'm not aware of people being referred back to, um, to Women's Aid with respect to seeking, for example, accommodation and support. If that is the case, I would certainly be happy to hear more from the member in that regard. I call Jerry Kelly. Just a question for 
Mr Speaker, over recent months it has been extremely disappointing and indeed distressing to hear of sporadic interface violence at a number of locations across the north of the city. Any such trouble where it has a sectarian motivation is a hate crime and I unreservedly condemn it. The Department, in partnership with the Northern Ireland Policing Board, funds the North Belfast District Policing and Community Safety Partnership. A core part of that body is, remit, is to re improve community safety and to tackle antisocial behaviour. The interface team within the department also works to broker interagency cooperation between DOJ, Belfast City Council, the PSNI, Education Authority, Youth Justice Agency and Housing Executive in order to tackle the underlying causes of interface tensions. If we are to address those tensions and the violence successfully, then we also need local political and community support and leadership to do so. Thank you. Supplementary, Jerry Kelly. Thank the Minister for her um, answer up to now. And, uh, while I accept that the multi-agency approach is an approach which is very necessary and it isn't just down to place, I suppose the question was in terms of the Justice Department and what specifically um, she thinks is the way to go forward uh, and, and the actions which can be taken. Uh, there are issues, there are, there are issues, uh, I may say, and I should have said by the way I'm a member of the Policing Board, but there are issues around what can be physically done in some of these areas, small moves which would make a big difference in some of these areas, and, and it is happening on a daily basis. A, um, thanks to all of those representatives for North Belfast because I know that although there has been this particular issue over recent weeks and months, in other elements there has been good progress in terms of trying to build safer and stronger communities in that neighbourhood. My department continually works to try to get that interagency cooperation to which I referred um, and in order to look at options to design out crime, um, also considering what support might be available in terms of diversionary activities um, and other such interventions. With community consent, there is also good progress being made. Indeed, in recent months, interface structures have been re-imaged and removed at Duncairn Gardens and Hazelbrook Drive, both in North Belfast. Whilst I understand that there is a growing frustration um, that perhaps more could be done to tackle this issue, um, I think that it is difficult um, unless we are able to capture um, not just the actions that the police are involved in, but also, I think, wider actions um, that are being taken in that area. I am committed to working on a cross-departmental basis to address the underlying causes of violence um, and that together building a united community strategy has also sought to break down those barriers between different parts of our community. Those determined to disrupt the peace and quiet that many residents had been enjoying along interface uh, dividing lines in North Belfast simply must not be allowed to succeed. I call Kelly Armstrong. Sorry, my supplementary has been asked. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Robbie Butler. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my supplementary may have been asked, but just like to ask the Minister to outline there any further <clears throat> uh, cooperation between her department and the Department of Communities in respect uh, of this. My departmental officials themselves have been on the ground with the PSNI colleagues at Spamount and North Queen Street to ascertain what measures can be taken to increase community safety in the area, improve conditions for local people and create deterrence to antisocial behaviour. We also work in partnership with Belfast City Council, with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and with other agencies who have their staff on the ground um, in those neighbourhoods. Um, we also recognise that on occasions we will look to convene those with, another role, with other roles to play in addressing these problems, and in other places we will just be making our contribution via established community and statutory partnerships. So it's important that it is not just that for the Department of Justice to lead on this, but it is something that we collaborate and work constructively with others about, and that includes agencies of the Department for Communities, clearly the Housing Executive and others. And I call Jamma Dolan. Yeah. Question five. I recognise that antisocial behaviour is an ongoing issue in local communities and causes anxiety and suffering for the residents of those communities. This is no doubt magnified by restrictions in place over recent months, with more people at home and some looking for alternative social places to meet. 
Partnership working between the relevant agencies who have the levers to address this issue is vital to deliver a swift and coordinated response to problematic behaviours and the underlying causes of that behaviour. Fundamentally, my plans to address antisocial behaviour are based on supporting a collaborative approach and at a local and strategic level to, where possible, prevent antisocial behaviour occurring in the first place, to resolve issues at the earliest possible stage through interventions and support communities and individuals most impacted by that behaviour. The newly established Multi-Agency Community Safety Board will give effect to better linking the strategic and operational response to community safety issues such as ASB. Through existing operational mechanisms such as policing and community safety partnerships and support hubs, processes are being developed to pool collective knowledge and resource to ensure an effective and joined up response. While prevention and targeted interventions of negative and risk-taking behaviours is the preferred approach to protecting people and communities, I am also aware that it is important to ensure relevant agencies have effective and proportionate enforcement powers in place to ensure that action is taken where necessary. My department is currently working with partners in relevant government departments to review antisocial behaviour legislation. Call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for her comprehensive answer. Um, it has been two years since DOJ uh, did a consultation on the current criminal legislative framework to tackle antisocial behaviour. So I am just asking the Minister if she can tell us if she intends to make legislative changes to tackle antisocial behaviour and if so, will they form part of the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill? Well, in terms of progress that's been made, I would be more than happy to meet with the member um, and just set out some of the actions that have been taken in terms of what we have been able to deliver um, thus far. Not all of the antisocial behaviour review will require legislation. Some of it will simply require um, a different option in terms of delivery. My officials are aiming to progress the outworkings of the review consultation as quickly as possible. However, the challenge is that some of the powers under consideration sit outside this department. Officials are therefore liaising with counter parts in other departments to agree which department will be best placed to take forward the powers um, that currently are under consideration. So it's not as straightforward as me simply bringing um, those matters to um, the House, but we will discuss that with other um, interested departments and try to seek a way forward. One of the key issues for the review is the ongoing challenges, particularly around Part 5, as you know, of the Criminal Justice Order. Um, given that it does not meet the policy intention of seizure and disposal of alcohol, current provisions allow for voluntary surrender only. And so the Department of Justice has taken steps, first of all, to improve PSNI powers to help address those issues, and are also talking uh, with uh, the Department for Communities, who has primary responsibility for alcohol regulation, in order to ensure that a better solution can be found. Call Gordon Dunn. Does the Minister recognise the need for additional resources for community policing? I think we all fully recognise the good work, especially within our constituency of, of North Down, the, the good work that has been done by community policing. And does the Minister uh, continue to urge the Chief Constable to provide uh, additional resources for community policing within our constituencies? Well, Mr Speaker, the issue of how the Chief Constable wishes to deploy his resources um, is an operational matter and one simply for the Chief Constable. However, he is on the record as having said that he believes that um, community policing is a priority, and therefore I hope um, that both he and indeed um, the members, uh, colleagues who sit on the policing board um, will hold him to account in terms of how he delivers on that priority. Kelly Arshaw. Very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the Minister and all her um, department for the hard work that they have put up with um, throughout this pandemic. But the Minister has mentioned already the new Community Safety Board. Um, as we all know, um, the issue of antisocial behaviour in our communities tortures some communities. Um, I'm just wanting to find out then from you about that establishment, who all is on that Community Safety Board, and what work is being done to avoid antisocial behaviour happening in communities. Well, it's very rare for community safety issues to be able to be resolved via either one agency or one board alone, and antisocial behaviour is no different. So the Multi-Agency Community Safety Board is a structure that aims to link the different strategic and operational responses to community safety issues together. The structure allows us to operationalise joined-up responses where necessary by stepping up and standing down a response group on any particular issue where evidence shows that it's needed. So, for example, the Community Safety Response Group was set up in May to consider the risks of antisocial behaviour in the absence of normal youth diversion and summer scheme interventions due to social distancing requirements. 
Without the support of formally approved and structured summer interventions, there was a risk of exacerbating the issue and of seeing a possible rise in young people entering the criminal justice system. Discussions in that case resulted in the Education Authority and PSNI working together to identify the most acute needs and agreeing appropriate mechanisms for engaging with young people. The Community Safety Response Group was also set up in August to address PSNI and NIHE concerns around unacceptable bonfires in some areas of concern. Again, agencies met on a number of occasions to address um, the associated ASB and related community safety issues from those. The learning from all of those um, different step-ups will allow us then to inform potential issues um, next week, or sorry, in the future. Well, Mark Durgan. I uh, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Partnership and collaboration are pivotal to so much we do in this Assembly, and it's certainly important if we are to address and prevent antisocial behaviour. Speaking uh, for my own constituency, the Housing Executive are always very proactive, always happy to engage with other agencies to address issues as they arise. However, it's my experience that are, there are some inconsistencies across the housing associations. Some are very proactive, while others display an unwillingness or inability uh, to engage with other agencies to address these problems. Is this something that the Minister uh, would consider raising with the Minister for Communities, if not the Federation of Housing Associations themselves? Well, I thank the member um, just for his input into this, and I think that that is indeed something that we would be more than happy to raise um, through uh, the Antisocial um, Behaviour Board. I think that there is an opportunity through the cross-departmental working that we have through that board um, to find mechanisms to raise it, whether it be through the Northern Ireland Housing Executive itself or indeed um, directly with the Minister, and I would be more than happy to take that forward. I call Melissa McHugh. Uh, I have a question. question she. <clears throat> Number six. Mr Speaker, improving health within the criminal justice strategy um, support action plan was jointly developed by my department and the Department of Health prior to its publication in June 2019. Seven thematic areas were identified within the strategy, which translated into a total of 45 actions to be taken forward on a joint basis between health and justice, including our respective partners. The action plan, which is currently subject to a further update, reports 69% of the actions is on track for completion, complete or embedded in business as usual activities. 31% of the actions within the joint action plan were assigned to my department as lead, of which 71% are on track for completion, complete or embedded in business as usual activities. Melissa McHugh, Supplementary. Uh, Minister, um I'm sure you'll agree with uh, me that many of those who enter the criminal justice system already suffer from complex health needs, including mental health and addiction. And uh, the Department of Justice, they have a key role in improving uh, situations for those people. Uh, therefore, uh, is the Minister satisfied that positive changes in this area are progressing fast enough uh, in order to make provision for the most needy in that respect? Well, Mr Speaker, I think that the member raises a very valid point in terms of the degree to which many of those who are in our care within the justice system um, have already fallen through the cracks um, of the health and particularly the mental health services and also addiction services and others. People often have a complex um, range of needs when they enter the justice system. Um, and what we have within the justice system is a microcosm of wider society. So the responses that we use within the justice system in terms of offering people support, um, in terms of their mental and physical well-being, I think have to reflect um, best practice outside of the justice system. And so we work very closely um, with our partners, um, particularly those um, in the PSNI, PCSPs, Probation Board, Youth Justice Agency, Prison Service, and of course, most importantly, our, our partners in the health department who help us to ensure um, that in whatever way people come into contact with the justice system, whether it be a short intervention um, in the street, whether it be a longer term intervention within the prison system, um, that we put health and wellbeing at the forefront of what we do. Next question, I call John O'Dowd, and just to advise you that you have a minute. Gary, uh, can you have a short question, number seven? Since the publication of Prisons 2020, the way forward in July 2018, Northern Ireland Prison Service has driven a programme of continuous improvement across the organisation with the aim of delivering better rehabilitation for people in our care. 
Years one and two have seen significant progress made towards the strategic commitments across each of the four strands of the programme. Plans for the first two years of the programme detailed over 180 deliverables, of which only 5% were not achieved. I am delighted that these achievements resulted in significant improvements both for staff and people in our care, including delivering state-of-the-art um, accommodation and technology across the estate, developing innovative interventions to assist the most vulnerable in our care, and supporting our staff to carry out their unique and challenging role. The impact of the programme has been further evidenced by the excellent inspection reports received over the past two years in both McGabry and Hyde Bank. The programme has now entered its third and final year. Aligned with our ambition is the recognition that we are working in a complex and challenging environment which has been heavily impacted by the pandemic. While the organisation has maintained its drive for improvement, consideration is now being given to revisiting the programme time schemes, scales to reflect the additional pressures presented by it. That ends the period for a list of questions. We move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to provide or to give an assessment from her department's perspective in terms of the penalties and the enforcement of COVID-19 regulations? Mr Speaker, as members will be aware, um, the Department for Justice led a review recently um, of the penalties for enforcement of COVID regulations, um, and we passed um, at executive um, increases in those penalties, which are now being taken forward um, in cooperation with the PSNI and other partners, um, and those regulations should be led shortly. Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, the, the Minister, for her uh, answer to that question. Uh, can the Minister give us a time frame? I appreciate she says they should be laid shortly. Uh, would the Minister agree that these, um, these penalties and the enforcement is actually of the utmost importance at this minute in time, given the fact that we want to ensure we drive down the number of cases, but we also want to ensure that we can get our economy back, back open again, so enforcement and penalties are very much uh, important? I completely agree with the member, um, and it is important that we do so as quickly as possible. However, the timing of this um, will unfortunately be led largely by the time it will take for the PSNI to be able to produce um, the new enforcement notices, and there have been some issues around delays in that because of the pressure um, on the bespoke printing that is required for those enforcement notices. However, as soon as those enforcement notices um, are ready um, to be able to be rolled out across the, the police service, um, we have the regulations ready to be led in the chamber. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister uh, of Justice for an update on the work of her department to enhance prison officer health and well-being? As the member is aware, I have launched focused reviews on the support mechanisms and procedures the prison service has in place to ascertain if more could be done to help frontline staff. The review of the support services for serving staff was due to report by the 31st of October this year. The review team asked me for more time to consider this important issue and are now going to report to me in early December. A separate review of support services for former staff is also being progressed and I expect that report within the next month. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister of Justice for the attention she has given to prison officer health and wellbeing and ask the Minister if she agrees that whilst mental health must be addressed by all executive departments, that the Department of Justice has a particular need to ensure support for staff performing some of the most challenging public roles in our community? Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member um, for his comments. I know that he and indeed some other members in this chamber have taken a consistent interest in the welfare, well-being and support um, for current and former prison officers alike. Um, and I want to thank them for that. Prison officers carry out a very challenging and unique role in Northern Ireland and are to be commended for doing so. Wellbeing is embedded across the Northern Ireland civil service departments and help is available from Welfare Support Service and from Inspire. I want to support prison service staff, however, in every possible way, which is why I launched the reviews. I'll consider the findings of those uh, with NIPS and senior management um, as a priority once received. I call Colin Giller now. Can, um, can the Minister outline what plans, if any, she has to allocate additional funding to the Police Ombudsman's Office to deal with the backlog of historical investigations? 
Mr Speaker, the Police Ombudsman has contacted my office and we are due to meet to discuss this matter shortly. It would be inappropriate for me, um, I think, to discuss in advance of that meeting um, what my intentions may or may not be and until I have heard her case. But as with any other application for funding, it will be accompanied by a business case, which we will have to look at carefully. However, I am committed to ensure that the, the legacy piece that was supposed to be agreed by us at Stormont House and supposed to be taken forward in short measure um, is able to proceed because I believe that by not doing so, we are burdening both the PSNI and the Ombudsman's Office and indeed other parts of the justice system with policing the past when they should be mainly focused on policing the future. Colin Gillerne. Gormi Agat, Agus Gormi Agat, Ira, Fwyn Fragrashen. Obviously, we would much prefer to see the Stormont House Agreement mechanisms implemented in full due to the pressures that Legacy is putting, as you have said, on the PSNA and the Police Ombudsman resources. However, the Minister, I am sure, understands that many of these families have been waiting for many decades, including the family of Roseanne Mallon in my own constituency, for these investigations to be completed. Can you confirm if there are any funds ring-fenced to deal with Legacy and whether any of this will fund the Police Ombudsman? With respect to legacy funding, funding was set a ring fenced um, by the Northern Ireland Office in order to deal with legacy. However, my department has been advised that that is only available to draw down for issues related to the Stormont House Agreement and its structures and the setup of those, but not for wider legacy issues. I have written again to the Secretary of State to seek clarity on that matter, given the inherent delay that his change of process has led to um, in terms of delivering on those legacy structures, such as the HIU and others. So at the at the moment, the, the funding um, for all of these issues in terms of legacy is one which is very complex um, and uncertain. And what I would like to see is some certainty brought to this entire process. And I absolutely agree uh, with what the member says when it comes to the need for people who have been seeking truth and justice where possible to be able to continue to seek that and to get it in a timely manner. Um, and I think it's important that we have the resources to do that. But I don't think that it is only for um, this Assembly and indeed the Executive to find those resources. I believe that the UK Government has a significant role to play in that regard. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers so far. Could I ask the Minister of Justice to detail how the justice system intends to deal with parental alienation? Mr Speaker, um, our, as, as members will be aware, we are about to have, um, in the next few weeks, the consideration stage of the, um, of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Whilst it does not contain any um, specific reference to parental alienation, I do believe that the elements of that, um, that legislation which deal with the aggravating factors um, of the use and abuse of a child um, in such relationships can be captured um, by the by um, the, the legislation um, that we are taking forward. With respect to wider policy and practice in respect of parental alienation, um, as you'll be aware, um, the, the issues of families um, and the law around that actually rest with the Department for Health. However, we have had a long engagement with them in terms of parental alienation um, and how we can capture it as part of the domestic abuse offence. Marsh Bradley, supplementary. For that answer. Uh, it's just that I have been contacted by several constituents uh, who have children and haven't seen their children for several months, even up to a year. Given the pandemic, uh, many carers, primary carers, seem in some cases uh, to use and take advantage of the pandemic to inflict self-isolation on the, the other parents so that they can't uh, engage with their children. So how can the department act to prevent this happening? Well, Mr Speaker, there are a number of elements to this. I think, first and foremost, it would be fair to say that when it comes to the justice system, and particularly the family court system, that the needs um, and were ascertainable, the desires of the child have to be paramount. And therefore, there is a, re there is a reliance, if you like, on the judgment um, of the courts in terms of this. But it is also informed um, by social work um, and by those who have contact um, with the family um, to ascertain their needs. The best outcome for children is for children to be able 
able to have full investigations um, in terms of being able to um, have full access to both parents. And ideally, what we would like to have, Mr Speaker, is a situation where these um, family disputes don't reach the courts in the first place, but where they can be mediated. And as a result of that, there is an emphasis on mediation in terms of how we want to see the family courts and justice system move forward. Where it does end up in court, it is important, as I say, um, that the desire and the wishes and the needs of the children um, are paramount. And there is no excuse um, for preventing a child from seeing their estranged parent um, unless there is a risk to the well-being and health of that child. And I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Minister, for your answers so far. Uh, Minister, uh, can I ask what actions you're taking to address the imbalance in the religious breakdown of those employed within the Public Prosecution Service? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Public Prosecution Service does not fall within my remit in the Department of Justice. Um, it is actually an independent body that is funded by the Department of Finance. Thank you. While it is an independent body um, within the Finance, uh, would you make a statement every year in relation to the community background of the statistics of the employees within that service to the House? It would not be appropriate for me to make statements about the um, breakdown of people within that service because it is not a part of the Department for Justice. Dixon. Uh, Mr Speaker, Minister, could you provide the House with uh, an update on your legislative programme? Mr Speaker, my plans for the remainder um, of this term include um, the introduction of the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill in the Assembly um, today. The Protection from Stalking Bill, um, introduced hopefully to the Assembly at the beginning of December. A bill to change the personal injury discount rate um, to be brought forward in mid to late January. And a Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill to be introduced to the Assembly hopefully on March um, of next year. I appreciate that that is an ambitious um, and demanding programme, but I believe that we can deliver it if we work together. A good model is the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Families Proceedings Bill, where we have worked in partnership to improve and, I believe, enhance and sharpen that bill. I am very grateful to members of the committee um, for their constructive and timely consideration of the issues um, during scrutiny of the bill. And hopefully, if we can get through these final stages in terms of consideration, further consideration um, and final stage, it will be able to receive royal assent in the new year. And as the Chair noted uh, with some pride, despite people's concerns, Concerns that we may, because we did this locally, like behind Westminster, we're actually finishing ahead of them. Sure, Texas supplementary. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate, Minister, the uh, uh, extent of the programme which you have, but would you agree with me that reform of the committal process is absolutely critical part of speeding up justice here in Northern Ireland, and indeed that it has been reflected upon by both the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, the Northern Ireland Office, and by Mr John Gillan in his report on serious sexual offences? Yes, um, Mr Speaker, the changes in the bill are absolutely crucial to improving the speed of the justice system and delivering on the executive's priorities in new decade, new approach. They also deliver on a commitment arising from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, as the member rightly says, about, unavoidable, about avoidable delay in the criminal justice system, which was published in 2018. Whilst it is important in terms of tackling the speed of justice, it is also important in terms of the other benefits which it brings for victims and witnesses. So, for example, the Fresh Start panel recognised that a broad protection to victims and witnesses in paramilitary and organised crime related cases where there may co be coercion or intimidation. Further, the Gillen Review recognised the impact that it would have on vulnerable victims and witnesses of serious sexual offences um, in an effort to reduce trauma and attrition rates. And finally, the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice has made similar similar recommendations about reforming committal proceedings because she was concerned about the impact on serious sexual and child abuse offences and wanted those added to the schedule. And that will happen as a result of the committal reform being brought forward. It is also my intention um, progressively to add offences to the list of specified offences until traditional committal proceedings are eradicated entirely. And I believe that if the Assembly um, has the first reading um, of the bill today, it will be a significant first step in that process. Call Emma Sheeran. I get King Corley. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her answers uh, thus far. Can the Minister advise uh, whether the, a judge has been appointed by the Lord Chief Justice to oversee the Victims Payment Scheme? 
I have spoken with the Lord Chief Justice and he has assured me that such a, a nomination is imminent and we, hopeful, we are hopeful that an announcement will be made um, in the coming days. Thanks to the Minister for that. Um, can you advise if this will be an interim appointment or a permanent one? And if it is an interim, then why? I think my understanding of this is correct, um, that it has to be an interim appointment in the same way that all of the members of the panel will be interim appointments until this is formalised in legislation. But my understanding is um, that when we get this appointment, it's not necessarily going to be the case that there will be huge churn, given that most of those who have the, special, the specialisms and the skills um, we would hope would reapply when those become formalised posts. I call Colin McGrath. Um, could the Minister give us her assessment of the work of the community support hubs in identifying and protecting vulnerable people in our community? I think the community support hubs have been um, an incredibly useful tool um, and has, I think, have the opportunity um, to enhance cooperation and collaboration that's happening on the ground um, within the different organisations um, that are responsible um, both for identifying vulnerability and also responding to it. Um, I think it has also managed to bring partners together in collaborative ways of working uh, that are more streamlined than perhaps was the case before. Um, so I think that they have been a success and we would certainly hope um, that people will continue continue um, with those projects um, in the future and continue to work on the basis that has been set up under the hub system. And unfortunately the time is up and uh, I could ask members to take their ease for a moment or two to be prepared the chamber.